Okay. Um, hope you guys are all settled after break. So it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Van Bergen. Um, he comes to us all the way from Finland today, uh, where he's currently a postdoc at University of Helsinki. And he earned his PhD in zoology from the University of Cambridge and was also previously a postdoc at uh, the Gulbenkian Institute in Portugal. However, Eric um, wasn't always interested in research, so he actually started out his career in science education. He did his Bachelor's of Education in Biology at uh, Hogeschool, School, Rotterdam, and was a high school biology teacher for, for five years, seven years? He was a high school biology teacher for several years um, before going back to school and getting a, a master's in education, um, and then also a master's in evolution and ecology from Leiden University. Um, so after switching back to research, or into research for his master's, he's published on a wide variety of topics. Um, he has usually focused on butterflies and published papers on um, Topics including coevolution, speciation, plasticity, adaptation, inbreeding, and uh, behavioral ecology. And he's going to talk to us today about the ecological and evolutionary implications of shifting climates and climate variability. So if you'll join me in welcoming Eric. Excellent. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Also, yeah. it might be a All right, shift that up. How's that? Better. Better? There we go, indeed. That's my title of my talk. Um, indeed, I spent most of my research for the last years working on butterflies. And when we uh, got invited to give this, uh, to give, to give this talk, uh, one of the questions that came out, and I think it was from you, Catherine, is how, how did Stapewise so help you to address the research questions that you're interested in? And in my case, it was very simple uh, because uh, in the middle of my PhD, I ran into a problem that uh, in the end I was able to solve, well, uh, we were able to solve with stable stopes and that meant that I could finish my PhD and I can actually be here today. So that's also the line out of my talk. So I'm going to introduce my PhD topic, then the problem I bumped into and then how um, that in the end led to the results. So I work on these guys. These are my Khaleesi butterflies. For my PhD, I work on these. As you can see, they come in uh, many different shades of brown, basically. They're all brown and boring. They have these lovely eye spots. And actually, one of these, by Saigazani Nana, I'm now not sure which one is the marker, but it's up there, uh, has, a, has become a textbook example for seasonal um, uh, polyphenism or developmental plasticity, as we heard of a bit. Um, from Jim. Um, they occur in different habitats, from very deep forests um, to very open savanna regions, um, which obviously are also se seasonal. So if you keep staring at that picture, it starts changing and that poses a, a particular threat. Um, and you need to adapt to these environments. But important for my particular um, research is that they are uh, grass feeding as larvae. Um, so as adults, they feed, feed on rotten fruits, but the larvae itself, and this is a uh, first instar larvae um, in our lab, they feed on grasses. Um, sorry. Then when I started my PhD, we uh, first tried to reconstruct the phylo phylogenetic history. And um, this is the unrooted tree that we came up, uh, came up with in the end. Uh, they originated in Asia. Um, and then they kind of have these three parallel radiations going on, um, one in uh, Madagascar, one in Africa, and in, one in Asia. Um, and it, this kind of was interesting for us because you have these three parallel radiations that you can then use as three kind of different test tubes in which you can explore whether the, the processes that drove these, uh, diverse, these processes of diversification, the mechanisms that drove that, whether they are similar in these three different parallel radiations. So it kind of became our, our setup to test um, different hypotheses. Um, we were several um, people in our group in Cambridge, 
And we're kind of all focusing on different questions. One was looking into chemical communication, one in visual communication, and trying to find commonalities between uh, these different parallel radiations. And myself, I got interested in um, the interaction with their host plants because they are grass feeders, and we had um, uh, already seen some slides before in the introduction. Uh, there has been these very dramatic um, host, oh, sorry, biome shifts um, in, in the recent history. Um, one is the or origin of savanna grasslands, uh, roughly 70 milli uh, million years ago, and the evolution and later the global expansion of these C4 grasses that was already touched upon earlier. And, and you can imagine that if you are a grass feeder and there's this big transition, evolutionary transition in your host plant, that that might affect your uh, evolution yourself uh, in your, yeah, your own evolutionary processes. So to start with that, the first, and we actually already have seen that phylogeny, the evolutionary, sorry, the evolution of the C4 uh, photosynthetic pathway is this evolutionary novelty that is an adaptation to open habitat. And um, I like to show this phylogeny that we saw before because there's 22, over 22 independent origins only in the family of the grasses. Um, so here in blue, it's already pointed out, there's um, independent origins where in C4, C4 photosynthetic pathway evolves. Um, it evolves in different families or, um, sorry, in different genera, in different moments in time, starting roughly th 30 million years ago and kind of ongoing several origins of the C4 pathway. Um, that is important for my little herbivores because C4 grasses are not as palatable as, as the C3 ones. They are typically have less nutrition, uh, they are tougher, so you can imagine if you're a tiny caterpillar and you have to deal with a C4 grass, it's much harder than to deal with a C3 grass. Um, so then if you look back at um, uh, the evolution, evolutionary time, um, the C4 kind of grasses are at the moment very dominant in these open grassland environments, which is represented here. I'm going to press it. There we go. Represented by this kind of increase uh, in, um, in C4 abundance in open grass areas. Uh, this is an example from Kenya because my butterflies are also in Africa. And you see this transition. This is represented by the colors from very deep forested areas to the origin uh, of open habitats and, and later now uh, a lot of open savannas. <coughs> and you can imagine uh, that for my butterfly, a couple of things are interesting, right? So you live in these deep, deep forests, then there's a big transition, so you kind of have to adapt to these new open habitats. And at the same time, in that new habitat, C4 grasses become very abundant. So you can imagine that these two processes may or may not have shaped the evolutionary history of my um, tribe of butterflies that I was interested in. Just to summarize that up a bit, so you can imagine back in time, there's species, a species occurring in this deep forest. And um, the first process of opening the habitats already could lead to speciation events, right? Because you get these isolated patches of forest where you are retracting, and that means reproductive isolation, and that could lead to the first speciation event. But the later part is more interesting, I think, because from these isolated uh, patches, you could then adapt to open habitats where you get to deal with the C4 grasses, which you could then adapt to or not. Um, so for instance, if we follow this particular uh, line, let me see where it is. So this particular species then adapted and then could lay, uh, uh, adapted to the open environment and C4 grasses, and then could then later potentially retract to the forests where it still has the ability to deal with these four C4 grasses. So by reconstructing this, we thought we were going to end up with something, something, something like this, in which we could hopefully determine um, uh, when transitions to C4 grasses occurred, here indicated in red, uh, whether that's associated to where they live now. So whether, for instance, moving to the open environment um, uh, also forced you to start dealing with these C4 grasses and vice versa. So this is what I wanted to end up with. Um, so these two were kind of my key questions. When did uh, ancestral shifts to C4 grasses occur? Did it coincide with the origin of, of savanna grassland or the expansion of the C4 grasses a bit later? 
And were these two shifts associated with each other? So a shift to C4 and a shift to using, start using op open habitats. So I, I thought I'd dig into literature. There's a lot of information about butterflies, which is great because they have been studied by naturalists for, for years. So I thought I'd just pick one of the species, in this case by Saigranana. I start going through uh, the literature, what is known about the host plants in this case. Uh, could maybe use Oplismus, which is C4, uh, C3 grass, so from, for me interesting. And I thought if I keep doing this for all these species, I will end up with my butterfly species and a list of host plants, and I will try to map that on top of each other. Um, I was already quite disappointed by this. Could maybe use, and then a C3 grass. Uh, but then when I go to the next plant, there's uh, sorry, the next <laughs> species, there's no information. Uh, and this was actually true for most of the species. So good luck with that PhD of yours. Um, what are you going to do? So indeed, um, this is the problem I had, that we actually know a lot about all these butterfly species. Well, we only know it about the adults, the ones that you can see flying around, and you know the habitat, where they fly, and we know when the, it's stuff about the phenology, and etc. But we do not know anything about the larval ecology. Um, so that was a problem which we hope to solve by opening the isotopic toolbox. Um, uh, in that particular, stable isotopes of carbon, can we use them uh, to de detect the feeding history of the larvae um, by looking at adult butterflies? Um, and then maybe also get a little bit more information about the larval ecology by looking at stable, isotope, uh, stable isotopes of oxygen, um, can we detect um, atmospheric uh, variation in atmospheric humidity or ev ev evaporation stress during larval development? Um, so this one we have seen before these, these, that these C3 and C4 grasses differentiate differently uh, between uh, stabilized, uh, sorry, um, CO2 with a heavy isotope and the light isotopes, which is for me an excellent thing because I want to differentiate between whether these larvae use C3 or C4 grasses. Um, so basically, C3 grasses, uh, so if my larvae feed on C3 grasses, uh, I should be able to trace that in the adult and vice versa. Um, and secondly, I wanted to look at oxygen. It's a colleague of mine pointed out um, that's actually very interested in seasonal environments um, because basically, um, very simply, uh, when water evaporates, the heavy isotopes tend to evaporate slower. So if there is a high, eva sorry, high evaporation rate, you get this accumulation or enrichment of uh, uh, sorry, uh, oxygen-18 uh, accumulating in this pool of, uh, pool of water. Now, an insect um, kind of is a pool of water, right? It's 90% it's water uh, for a larvae in this case. It's 90% uh, water, and th they have been doing very interesting work on, um, on, on measuring the, the 18O signature in, um, in, in sorry, <coughs> um, let me think. Okay, so this larvae is a pool of water, so if you have higher evaporation rates, the uh, uh, oxygen 18 will um, uh, accumulate in that in that insect, but it, the funny or interesting thing is when an insect molds, especially when it molds to the final stage, you get that the exoskeleton later is no longer modified. So the chemical composition of what a larvae is cons uh, consists of is kind of uh, incorporated in the exoskeleton and then it doesn't change anymore. So we were thinking, can we use this um, to detect uh, under what atmospheric humidity conditions our larvae grow up? So very fast proof of principle. I think it's important we always do it. Uh, so we reared larvae uh, on C3, C3 grasses and on C4 grasses, and we just take, took a leg from uh, our individual, uh, from our um, adult, just to see whether it absolutely matches. Is there any enrichment, yes or no? Um, and we also wanted to know what does it actually reflect when you have mixed diets? Because these larvae, they walk around, they. Uh, typically I have a preference for particular host plants, but they might shift. So uh, we wanted to know whether when we switch them between a C3 and a C4 grass, what are we going to pick up in terms of isotopes? Um, well, firstly, we don't really see any enrichments. This is nice. So when I feed it on C3 grass, I'm going to be able to detect that uh, in the adult. Um, and for us also quite interesting is it mainly reflects the um, 
host plant, it has been feeding on during the final stage of larval development. So the final instar is what we're going to get back if we later look at the adult um, butterfly. So we can trace mainly the isotopic composition of the host plant used during the final uh, instar um, of development. Um, we also wanted to see whether this was actually true for our particular incense. So we, we reared host plants for three weeks under high and low humidity. Then we took little uh, larvae that also take three weeks to develop and we reared them um, under either high humidity or low humidity conditions. And then later we kept the adults that came from those larvae and we reared those under high and low uh, conditions. To and then mix all the treatments to really figure out which of these life stages are we picking up um, evaporation rates of the plant in the adult or in the larval. But it was very, very clear. So if we do this experiment in the lab, we, uh, and we in the end look at the lag tissue of the adult, what, we, what is reflected is actually the um, atmospheric, atmospheric conditions that the larvae were exposed to. So this is nice, proof of principle, um, but then we wanted to take that to the field. So first, uh, we had two long-term studies. One we conducted ourselves in Malaysia in a stable forest, community of eight species. And we had access to a long-term data set um, uh, from Malawi, which is a very seasonal environment. And there we had three different species that have kind of different habitat preferences. preferences. So some are more in the forest fringes, others are more right in the open. So we thought maybe we can detect differences there. Um, this is kind of the outcome. So if you, uh, if you look at, um, this is, sorry, this is in Malawi, the seasonal environment where we had data for three years, where you really clearly see these wet and dry seasons. So that, um, and that's reflected also in the humidity levels. Uh, and then, to compare that with Malaysia's study where it was a very stable environment, uh, no changes in humidity, no changes in rain, no changes in temperature. So these are the oxygen values that we got and um, reflect what larvae are exposed to during development. And you see, for starters, very clear seasonal variation, right? So uh, during the wet season, these larvae that develop are exposed to um, uh, much uh, higher humidity less evaporation stress and in the dry season when uh, it's very dry you get these enriched values in the in the tissue which is uh, interesting but for us more a bit more interesting is that we could see these clear differences between species that live in this very uh, similar um, environment but clearly have um, uh, differences in where the larvae develop right so these two this particular species by cyclus ina um, uh, clearly, if their larvae are exposed to drier conditions, are exposed to more evap higher evaporation rates. Um, we saw none of that in the eight species in Malaysia, which is not surprising because it's a stable environment and etc. etc. But didn't we see anything there? Of course. So there, we also looked at we used carbon to trace down what do these individuals, these larvae. So sorry, we have the adults, so, but what did the larvae actually use as, uh, as a host plant? And we start to see, well, for starters, a lot of variation. Um, so clearly there are some species that use both host plants, great. Uh, but there are also some species that very consistently, for instance, this Calapa species, uh, use C3 and nothing else, right? Um, some here, a few samples. Um, but there is variation and there seems to be some sort of a phylog phylogenetic pattern appearing. This is just eight species, but I already got excited because I had a phylogeny of 300 species and that's where I wanted to end up. Um, so I could go back, problem solve, I could clearly go back to my previous approach. Instead of looking in literature, I could go to museums, go to fields, etc., and start to collect samples that I can then later backtrace what do these larvae actually use. Um, and get as many samples as possible to see if we can map that out on the phylogeny and go back to what I actually wanted to uh, observe. So I, w I really would like to tell you that this is how I got all my samples, but in reality it's this. <laughs> in reality, my majority of the data comes from eight museums, um, and I had to bring this, this uh, 
uh, taxonomist, which is the world leading expert on these butterflies, and I really needed them. For me, they were all just brown, and it was really hard for me to distinguish, especially when I saw them all together, uh, which one is what. But in the end, with an expert like that, uh, and very, very great collections around the world, um, I was able for each species, in the end, the objective became to get at least 10 samples from across the, the range of the, the known range of the species. So in this case, my, um, Maditis, Bisaxis Maditis, occurs in this region, and I try to get samples uh, spanning that cross. I have uh, very different years, some actually more than 60, 70 years ago. And if I trace then back what host plants that they use, in this particular case, they all came back as C3 uh, across time and space. Um, so for me, clear evidence that this is a species that uses C3 in this natural environment. Then this other species, a very different pattern, where we still sampled across. Um, we see that it kind of um, uses sometimes C3, sometimes C4. At least it's able to use C4, which we thought is this very hard, very um, tough spe um, C4 grasses are tough. Apparently, this species is able to use those tough grasses. So that's already good evidence, because the other species um, doesn't. So then when you do keep doing that, <clears throat> and you go to all these museums, you end up with something like this. Um, so this is again the phylogeny I showed you before. This one uh, is time calibrated. So this is going back in time. As you can see this whole group is roughly 30, years, uh, 30 million years old. Again, the colors here represent where they occur. So in blue, the Asian species. In uh, red, the African species. And in uh, green, the species that occur on Madagascar. Um, so one thing for me uh, that was important, oh wait, let me first go around uh, what else is there. Uh, these bars represent the amount of, uh, it's basically a fraction of the isotopes I got. So all these big bars mean that all the samples that came back were C3 feeding. So when it starts deviating from that big bar, that means you get samples that actually come back as C4. That also means they have the ability to use C4 grasses, these tough C4 grasses. Then the balls represent where they actually, ha uh, where they actually live uh, at the moment, so the habitat choice. And I had to separate it in shaded and open environments or forest uh, and open um, habitat. Then, I rec <coughs> then you can reconstruct, using that information here that we got from the isotopes, whether the ability to use C4, um, or well, you can trace them back when that actually started occurring. Um, when you start seeing that transition. So one thing that was firstly important is that we got this ball. This is the reconstructed the ancestral state of this group, which very luckily for us is a, f a forest species, because um, and it's a C3 species, which is good, because if I would find that this is a C4 species before there was actually C4 in the world, I would have a problem, but it doesn't. So it, it started off as a C3 forest, a C3 using forest dwelling species. And then through time, um, you start to see that kind of, um, so the question, when did these ancestral shifts to C4 uh, host plants occur? Well, there's kind of these, so it's always a bit of a mess, these reconstructions, but you kind of see these clades popping up here in which species starting to use C4. And it kind of is around 16, 17 million years ago, which is the onset in many of the, in these three environments where my butterflies are coming from. That's the onset of the expansion or the origin of the grasslands. It's not necessarily when these grasses became uh, dominant. It's actually years and years before that. So the transition of starting to use these uh, grasses occurred uh, before they are actually the dominant force, uh, the dominant uh, vegetation in the environment, um, which is also something we saw in, in mammals, actually. Um, secondly, uh, what I was interested in is, are these shifts to C4 then associated to, sh to shifts into open habitat or vice versa? What happened first then, et cetera, et cetera. So do we find evidence for correlated evolution between habitat use and the use of these C4 grasses? Yes. Uh, that model is actually much more likely than the independent evolution of both, uh, so they, they really go hand in hand, uh, which makes sense, but it's nice to also see that confirmed. Um, and then because you don't have run that model, you can start looking into um, 
uh, this kind of pattern. So open habitat species are much more likely to make the shift from C3 to C4 um, than the other way around. And uh, CD, C4 adapted species are much more likely that to then move into these open habitats. So you can start, um, we can now start to disentangle uh, these, these patterns. Um, so then take home messages. These climate driven biome shifts um, can drive ecological diversification in herbivores. Insect species, as we have seen, shift to C4 grasses, occurred in each of these parallel radiations of Michelin sign butterflies around the same time. Um, shifts to C4 grasses are associated with the origin of um, uh, savanna grasslands and the co colonization thereof. And opening the isotopic toolbox can save your PhD, which is an important thing for me personally. <laughs> <coughs> and with that, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my supervisor, Paul Brakefield, lab members, technicians, people that surveyed in the field, um, etc. Uh, funding ERC, uh, the European Research Council, and with that, you for your attention. Thank you so much. Questions? I have a couple of stupid questions. Great, um, I love those. Yeah, I figured. Um, how long do they live? And sort of give me a sense of how long the larval stage is and how long the adult stage is and how long it takes them to molt. Um, and all of those questions are obviously relevant for the seasonality. Yeah. So I, 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 I was hoping someone would come up with a slide like that, a question like that. Uh, because there's one thing I didn't tell, but I, this is one of the favorite things about my, uh, about this system, is that there is seasonal polyphenol. I did mention it, but uh, this is a great, I think, a great example of that. So they, they, this is a very hard question because it's very different. So in the wet season, so they have these two seasonal forms, and it uh, depends on the temperature during larval development, whether they're going to develop in either this beautiful wet season form or in this very dull and brown dry season form. And um, there are seasonal strategies to avoid um, predation, um, but it's all suit of traits, including lifespan, and that's why I bring it up. Um, so during the wet season, it's really, um, you really live fast, die young. Um, so they live very, very, as adults, very, very short, maybe a couple of weeks. A larval developmental time is therefore also very short, also a couple of weeks. Um, but then in the dry season, uh, of course, larval development is much l longer because the temperatures are cooler, uh, but they tend to live for months because that is the generation that has to last throughout this entire dry season to become the next generation, uh, so to produce the next generation uh, that is going to be, be the wet season. Um, butterfly. So they have really different um, lifestyles, these different seasonal forms. Uh, so the to answer your question, dry season form butterflies live many, many months, uh, and wet season short, very, very short, fast, fast, fast. They have two generations in the in the shorter wet season, and they have only one in the dry season, which is seven months. I had one other very brief, stupid question, which is: uh, Is there any sort of migrational patterns, or do you think you can pick those up at all in these migrational patterns in this species? Whether it's any evidence, yeah. um, not that I know of. So there's these several ways you can cope with variation in the climate. Uh, one of them is migration, move away from where it's bad. Um, and this one really seems to put all his, his uh, efforts on being plastic and making sure that you can stay in the same environment, even though it is very seasonal and there is seasons, seasons of plenty and seasons of stress. But that is the way it seems to be dealing with this. Uh, and no, and they're very tiny. Eh? I don't think they are migrating and there's well they have been doing mark recapture studies and it has been shown they disperse but they hang around and they move a couple of hundred meters and so no evidence of that okay one more quick question um, first of all this is really exciting to see the correlation between the c4 story in africa and butterflies so i'm a 
I'm a worker on that C4 story, so it's very satisfying to see that it's useful for something I could never imagine. Yes, um, there you go. That's <laughs> awesome. It's very, but I, I also saw, I cannot help but ask about your oxygen isotopes, and I saw you probably had a slide. So do you have oxygen isotopes from any of these uh, that you sampled from museums? No, actually. You don't? Sorry, no. Oh, OK. Uh, from museums, no, I, you know, I do have them from the field, but not from all these. Do you have a, no, we didn't do, do that because the story of the oxygen isotopes at all, or is that emerging? Or no, actually, we didn't do because they're so well. Like if I press this, oh, yeah, there's so much variation um, across <laughs> environments in in, uh, in in oxygen that we didn't want to bother bother because it's an, another analysis, and you need. Um, so then we thought, well, let's focus, put all, put all the money on the carbon. Uh, so that's what we did. But um, yeah, so we didn't look at that. Thank you.